Doon da doon. Doon 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 da doon doon brown 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 brown. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby and today I'm going to be taking you through some really exciting wins in the one the only exchange Slav defense. Um, we're going to be taking a look at some old games and some new games, but boy oh boy are they some fun chess games. Now, of course, the Exchange Slav, as it stated in the title, has a bit of a reputation for being a more boring opening, but we're going to see that there is plenty to play for with the white pieces, um, and we're going to see how different players approach the positions. But to start with, we are going back in time to a world champion by the name of Mikhail Botvinnik, and in this game, Botvinnik was up against Smyslav in a head-to-head -head match. So let's see what was going on in this game. Of course, the exchange Slav starts with d4, d5, c4, um, c6, c takes d5. Uh, and now, you might expect that this is how this game started, being that the lecture is on the exchange Slav. But you would be wrong. The players actually began d4, d5, knight f3, knight f6, c4, c6, c takes d5, c takes d5, changing approximately nothing. Um, well, jokes aside though, this does change a little bit. Sometimes you'll see players with the white pieces not actually commit this knight to f3 with the idea of uh, keeping this knight back on g1, and we're going to see why that might be a good idea a little bit later on. But this game, we have the knight on f3 in this exchange slav. Uh, white continued by developing the second knight with knight c3. Now we have knight c6, and Botvinnik continues with the move bishop to f4. Um, nowadays, a lot of players really prefer to get this bishop outside the pawn chain with the black pieces as well. And while that is a really good idea, black is going to have to know some stuff if you do want to play a move like bishop f5 here. Um, and what is that stuff? Well, you have to be well prepared to meet the move queen to b3 whenever you're playing this move bishop f5. But this is definitely playable for black, but just by virtue of being a move ahead, uh, white can make black's life a little bit more difficult if black does try to follow suit with total symmetry and get this bishop outside the pawn chain. Um, all that being said, Smyslav actually goes e6 in the game. And I can tell you, playing the exchange slav myself, just practically, um, over the board and online, you do face a lot of players that are willing to just play e6 and say, okay, I don't need my bishop outside my pawn chain. You're playing the exchange slav. It's not like I'm going to be under that much danger. And they'll just go e6. Now, in my opinion, this is actually going to be a less accurate uh, line for black than bringing the bishop outside the pawn chain. It's just... Uh, a little bit less than comfortable to have this bishop back here on c8. So let's see how white tries to take advantage of it, because of course the position is still quite symmetrical, uh, symmetrical pawn structure, and black is going to get developed and castled quite quickly. Well, we see e3 by Bodfinnik, nothing crazy yet. Bishop e7 is Smyslov's choice, keeping this bishop on the board rather than going bishop d6, which is also possible. Uh, simply bishop d3 by Bodfinnik, kingside castles by black, and then a nice little subtlety here by white, he goes h3, sort of anticipating that if you do castle, black may on occasion be interested in capturing your bishop. So h3, giving this bishop a little hidey hole before getting castled. Bishop d7 is now the move by black. While this bishop is not doing great outside the pawn chain, it does want to leave the back rank in order to free up something like this, like the c8 square and also potentially come back to e8, where it can help defend the king's side. Um, king side castles by white is played. Now we see a6 by black, a very common move, uh, preparing perhaps a b5 break, when black will look to take over the c4 square. Now we see the very simple rook c1 by white. So far, so normal, right? This is exactly what you would expect to see from an exchange slot. That's why I'm sort of going through these moves rather quickly. Nothing too crazy is happening just yet. But we'll see that, you know, while the position does remain very symmetric, we're going to see white is able to force some imbalances here rather quickly. Uh, bishop e8 is Smyslov's choice, which I do think is a little bit of a strange move. Uh, normally, you see black try to contest the c-file, advance the play on the queen side with b5, or get this queen activated as well, something like queen a5, if I could draw the arrow. 
with the point being that a lot of the time you will be able to bring this rook out to c8 before playing the move bishop e8. But Smyslov plays bishop e8 right away, which in my opinion is a little bit of a strange move. Uh, and now Botvinnik plays bishop back to b1. And here some interesting things start happening already. With the way that Smyslov has played, I think he understood that he was actually going to be on the worst end of things on the queen side of the board. Given enough time, white is going to be able to take over on this side of the board with moves like knight a4 and knight c5. Uh, for example, let's say black still tried sort of stubbornly to play on this side of the board. Something like, you know, just the move rook c8, for example. Um, already, I think white has a myriad of options, but... Even queen d3 is going to be playable, or prefaced with a3 as well to stop knight to, uh, to b4. And now if something like knight a5, um, again, there are going to be a lot of options here. But whenever the knight leaves the center, it sort of makes way for this knight to enter. And now it's just going to be awkward in the long run for black to get this rook into the game if the play maintains on the queen side. White is just always going to be a little bit faster with this rook ready to join in the action and this bishop as well applying some pressure. So Smyslov, for better or worse, chose a different approach to this game and goes knight h5. Now knight h5 on its own doesn't seem too crazy, right? You attack the bishop, the bishop retreats back to h2, but then perhaps number one, fearing some potential activity on this diagonal, and number two, worried about how to solve the problem of this rook, uh, Smyslov continues with this move f5, and this is a very double-edged idea uh, for such a so-called boring opening. So chatroom, I already want to get your thoughts on this idea of f5. Let me know what you think here. Uh, what is your general feeling of this position? What's your feeling on this position? And I will refresh my chat. Okay, maybe the chat just has no feelings. Is the chat feelingless? This could be. Well, I'll tell you my feeling on the position. Okay, there they go. Um, Peter doesn't like black's pawn structure. Probably after this move f5, noticing that this pawn on e4 may be a little bit weak. Um, it also is, as stated, weakening this e5 square a little bit. But in return, of course, black is getting a lot more uh, strength in the e4 square. And Chess King actually think black has an easier position, and I think that's a reasonable thing to say. And now the chat already has a, a very active idea that is definitely going to be an important one, and one to keep in mind. And that is, f5 is sort of, uh, for the moment, blocking this diagonal, but if something ever happens to this f-pawn, maybe black will live to regret not having this pawn back on f7, where it can help defend the light squares. Now, what's going to happen to this f5 pawn? Well, perhaps the move g4 is going to be a very active idea that black has to keep an eye on. Uh, and while it is sort of playable immediately, um, I don't know if we want to be going out all out just yet over here. It is sort of difficult to imagine how we're really adding any more attackers to this side of the board other than this bishop on this one diagonal. So instead, Botvinnik keeps that idea in the back of his head and simply continues play on the queen's side. f5, while it does look like a strange move, that's no reason to sort of abandon our plan over here of improving our knights, playing on this side of the board, and Botvinnik just continues naturally with knight a4. Um, now Smyslov does decide it's time to kill this bishop and goes bishop to d6. Botvinnik continues with knight c5, take on h2, take on h2, and now queen e7. And now is the time to find some concrete ways to uh, solidify the advantage here with white. So how do we solidify this advantage? We're going to start turning it into something very, very concrete very shortly. Mm. 
McGothy says, totally boring. Well, it may, might not stay totally boring for too very much longer. Unless he just means, you know, me in the lecture in general, in which case I cannot help you. So Chess King says the move F4, and I'm seeing a lot of noise in the chat about dedicating your life to putting a piece on the e5 square, and I just don't think that that is really the way to go here. Um, if we really wanted to, we could play something like knight d3 over to e5. We could put all of our pieces focusing on this square, and we might even achieve you know, putting a knight there, but I don't think this is going to be a winning idea. The knight on e5 might be a good piece, but it's not really working with white's other pieces, right? It puts a little pressure on the c file, but but really I don't think that's going to make too big of a difference. And playing a move like f4 is definitely going to be a little bit too weakening, right? You know, we saw black weakening some squares with the move f5, but it's not really an excuse for white to just go ahead and weaken all the same squares with something like f4. For example, knight g3, knight e4, and black is sort of doing this plan better than white here. If we ever take um, either pawn takes, let's say this one, and it's already going to be difficult for us to keep control over all these squares in our own camp. So what um, Botfinite goes ahead and does is, first of all, just increases the pressure on the queen side with the move queen b3. We see rook f7, and then he does something really, really great. He starts playing on both sides of the board. Now, why is that such a good deal? Well, it's always sort of a balance in chess of figuring out if you can break through on one side of the board just by piling up your pieces there, or if it's better to stretch your opponent's pieces thin with you know that principle of two weaknesses. Generally, that's sort of stated as an endgame principle, but it works quite often in middle games as well. Very useful to know. By sort of stretching the black pieces thin, playing on both sides of the board, Botanic is able to create threats everywhere while the black pieces are just not able sort of to parry everything. And what's the way to do that? Well, it's with the chat room's move from earlier. Now is the right time to play the move g4, breaking down black's light square blockade of this long diagonal. Um, you're not able to just save the knight because I will take on f5 and win a pawn. Um, so f takes g4 is needed. Now h takes g4 forces the knight back. And Botfinic does now follow up with the move f4, although it is, of course, under very different circumstances. Now Botfinic is happy to play f4 because, of course, Botfinic is keeping control over this square on e4 versus the other variation when black was able to quite uh, easily occupy that square. Now, uh, unfortunately... Uh, Smyslov sort of cracks under the pressure already, although I will say I think white is quite close to just having a, a strictly winning position outright. Um, the move that Smyslov tries is b6, which is a pretty interesting pawn sacrifice. The idea is after queen takes b6, rook b8 is coming, and now after queen takes a6, the idea, I imagine, was to break through uh, on, with rook takes b2. Now, let's take a look and see what happens if Smyslov doesn't play like this. Uh, what do you think uh, Botvinnik's idea was if Smyslov just played some sort of normal looking move, um, like rook to c8 here? How would play continue from here? Um, and in the chat, Dylan asks, wouldn't b6 kick the knight off of c5? Well, for the moment, as stated, Queen takes b6 would be the idea. And yeah, Steve was wondering how to activate this bishop. Well, you're looking at it. You're looking at it with this g4 idea. So the idea is going to be, while we wait for the uh, delay to catch up here, it is actually going to be g5. In this case. What's the big deal with g5? Well, this is removing the last sort of defender of these light squares around the black king. Um, this knight also really doesn't have anywhere to go. If it comes to d7, it's going to be interfering with the defense of the b7 pawn, 
comes to e4, it's just going to get captured. g4 is unavailable. And, of course, the last square is h5, where it, it can, in fact, go. But now, already, there are going to be problems in black's camp. For example, queen c2, g6 is, is the best defensive try, but now knight g4. And you can see here that um, the king side is really breaking down for black. And don't forget about these weaknesses on the queen side as well, and this weakness on e6, right? Black simply has too much to keep track of here. And play might continue something like um, rook f8 to step out of the fork, even queen g2, queen h2, which is bringing the queen over to the king's side. And then let's say black tries to start pushing over here on the queen's side. The simple move, knight d3, knight e5, and as stated, white is just going to sort of roll over black on the king's side here. Uh, just to continue the line, let's say b5, knight e5. Um, takes would actually hang a rook, so you can't do that. Um, queen b7, maybe. And, yeah, gosh, I don't know. Do I, do I need to go further? Like, we're not going to get to the point where it's an, a knockout blow, but uh, white is just going to keep building the pressure here, and, and black is sort of going to be helpless. Uh, for example, knight e5. Let's say black just continues. Can take on c8, take on c8. Queen d2. Bring in a rook, and... Uh, all of black's pieces are bad, and all of white's pieces are good, which is good enough for me. What was the point of all that? Well, the point of all that is that Smyslov likely understood that if he just sort of plays some sort of slow move, g5, and then these moves like queen c2, knight's coming into e5, it's just going to be an awful, awful position for black, where none of black's pieces really make sense, and this knight on h5 is just dominated out of the game. So, Smyslov does go for this interesting idea of b6, with the point to activate the rook along the b file. Now, queen takes a6 was played, and rook takes b2 is likely the best move for black here. I imagine uh, Smyslov saw something wrong with this that he didn't quite like, but I would like the chat room to try and figure out what they would play in this position with white, because black actually has a really interesting idea that you have to be on the lookout for here. Black actually does have an idea to look out for. So let's start with the natural move. What's the natural move? Has to be g5, right? Has to be g5. If you play some sort of, I don't know, normal move, guess what black is gonna do? Black is gonna play g5 themselves. And after this move, your position is going to get a little bit awkward. If you take on g5, look out for knight takes g4, um, highlighting the fact that this knight is overworked. So scary stuff. So let's start with g5. Let's start with g5. Um, what is black going to do after g5? Well, there's a really killer move here in the form of e5. And I think this is what Smyslov had in mind in the game. because he went for something very, very similar. But unfortunately, his line was a little bit less accurate. So what's going on after e5? What's going on? Well, you might imagine that you can take this knight on f6, and you would be correct. But after rook takes, um, let's say a simple retreating move like queen d3. Now, all of a sudden, white is actually dead lost. You heard me right. White is dead lost here to the idea of e4, the queen moves out of the way, rook g6 check, king h1, rook takes h2, not rook g2, but rook takes h2, and queen h4 mate. So white does have to be very careful here, because black is on the attack. And it turns out that the best way to actually win the position is to play the really kind of, on the one hand simple, on the other hand uh, sort of a natural move, queen a3. You, you just evict this rook from its post on b2, and then white is able to win sort of without consequence. Rook takes h2, for example, king takes h2, um, e takes f4, and you can still take this, but maybe simplest is just to take this guy. And here, after a check, knight takes d4. Black is definitely still the one with a lot of activity, but the pieces are coming to the king's defense in this case, and white is just going to be winning here. 
Um, so I think this is what Smyslov should have gone for, sticking with this rook takes b2 idea. In the game, he chose a less accurate move order with e5, which now does fail to a variety of moves. For example, the simplest is just to take. Black's idea was to capture now, um, but after f takes c5, queen takes c5, white to move and win is pretty simple. You just offer the trade of the queens, and that is the end of the story. Queen g3 check, rook takes b2 does come, but this threat is very easily parried with rook to c2. Uh, just blocking along the second rank, and then black resigned shortly after. g5, g6, takes takes and black had seen enough in this case. So I really like this game by Botvinnik. Why do I like this game so much? Because um, it's, you know, it, sorry. Um, it's great for what he did do on the board, but it's also great how we see black sort of just self-destruct, right? White didn't do too much special here, but the point was black's position was just already uncomfortable out of the opening and he felt the need to play these moves like f5, and that's sort of what you know tore the game apart. So it's almost just as much a great game because of the lengths Smyslov went to to avoid just that slow, dominating crush, and that's why we ended up seeing so much action. So critics might say, you know, this game isn't so great, black just fell apart with knight h5 and f5, but I think that's what really shows the power of, you know, the, the opening choices of both of these players. Botvinnik managed already by move 12 to put Smyslov in a position where he felt that this sort of um, risky strategy was, was necessary. This is what he had to go for because black, white's pieces were just better placed than black's. So I want to open it up to any questions on this game before we move on to players arguably even better than Botvinnik and Smyslov. Ben Feingold once said that games that start boring tend to become interesting later. Seems to be true here. And I don't know if I've noticed this tendency. I think there are many examples where games start boring and then end abruptly without any interesting things. But I take the point. I do think these, these things happen as well. Um, can white go knight d3 after black goes rook b2? Let's see what we're talking about here. If rook b2 here, knight d3 then I do think this exchange sack is going to be going to be a good one, as Steve North is suggesting. And why isn't this good after queen a3? Um, well, knight takes g4, king h3, and white is somehow surviving this one. Somehow surviving this one, although granted, you know, the game is definitely not over. White does have some defenders around the king still, though. Um, but as I say that, I think, again, maybe this move, um, e5, is, is going to come in handy for black once again. So definitely, I think rook takes b2 here would have been the, the way to go. Um, in this particular instance, of course, rook takes b2 is threatening mate. But yeah, the immediate rook b2, I think, would have been a lot more accurate from Smyslov, and it would have put the pressure on white quite, uh, quite a bit. And oh yeah, so what I was recommending was g5 before queen a3 with the point that now this is much less dangerous because there's no queen coming in that you need to worry about too much. Although this move apparently loses, so maybe there are things to worry about, right? Maybe there are things to worry about still. Uh, but king h1, and you are keeping these pieces out. Okay, let us move on then to game number two, which is going to be a game between Wesley So and Magnus Carlsen. Uh, maybe you saw that coming when I said players even better than Botvinnik, but yes, Magnus with the black pieces has in fact actually fallen victim to the power of the exchange Slav. So the next time you feel bad about losing to a quote-unquote boring opening, you know, just think back to this game between Wesley So and Magnus Carlsen. And I didn't do um, a ton of research. This game is from Norway Chess in 2018. And maybe this was the last classical game of chess Magnus had lost before he went on this long unbeaten streak. I don't actually fully remember, but this was definitely around that time. So, you know, these are the days when Magnus sort of stopped losing chess forever. That's how bad this game hurt. He lost this game, and he was like, I'm just never going to lose another game of chess ever again. Um, so we do get the normal move order for the exchange slav, by the way. 
and white chooses bishop f4 rather than knight f3 in this case. We see knight f6, knight c3, knight c6, and then Wesley does go knight f3 here anyways. Of course, e3 would be another option, with the point being you can bring this knight to e2, but again, we do see knight f3. Now a6 by Magnus Carlsen, rook c1 by Wesley So, and bishop f5. So in this case, you know, these modern day grandmasters, they realize it's not good to shut your bishop in inside the pawn chain. Then you have to start playing like Smyslov and doing crazy things like f5, and nobody wants that. So Magnus, being the professional that he is, develops his bishop outside his pawn chain. We see e3 by Wesley. Um, these queen b3 ideas probably don't make as much sense anymore because white hasn't played e3 yet, this bishop isn't coming into the action, and this uh, tempo with rook c1 isn't exactly helping the action over here on the queen side. Something like knight a5 would likely be the response, and there are plenty of ways for black to deal with these, these threats on the queen side. So, e3 instead by Wesley. The game continued with rook to c8 by Magnus. This is all very much mainline stuff. Bishop e2 by Wesley So, keeping these pieces on the board for the moment. e6 now by Magnus. We get castles. And then Magnus does start to go into slightly more of a sideline. Right here, the most popular move is bishop d6, with these bishops getting traded off rather quickly. But Magnus instead chose the move knight to d7. What's the point of knight to d7? Well, you open up this diagonal, uh, first of all. Second of all, you are sort of playing against white's idea of controlling the e5 square a little bit. And you're bringing this knight into good position to help contest things on the queen side of the board as well. Um, now, Wesley continues in normal exchange slav fashion with the move knight a4. Just because black is playing against this idea doesn't mean white should stop going for control of the c5 square. It's always critically important in the exchange slav positions to control this square. Um, bishop e7 played now, and we again see the, the generally useful move h3. Um, I want to point out that white is in no rush to play a move like knight to c5, White's also not really in a rush to commit this queen to any square. Like, you don't really want to commit to b3 when knight a5 is available. You don't really want to commit to the d2 square when a knight could still potentially land on um, e4. And in fact, if you do start playing moves like queen d2, you might even be in a little bit of danger of a sort of surprise attack idea by black here. So black to move after some sort of nothing move like a3 or, or queen d2. What do, you, what do you guys think you would play with black? Mm. Black to move here. In the boring, boring, boring exchange slav. Oh my god, it's so boring. Uh, Peter in the chat has also decided to never just lose a game. He will either win or learn something. That's similar to what Magnus has chosen, although I believe Magnus is claiming to have learned enough, and so he's just just not going to lose. And yeah, um, the Russian or the Cyrillic characters in the chat, I can't read those sadly, says g5, and this is the, the right idea. g5 is actually really awkward for white to meet. Bishop g3, for example, and not the immediate g4 when this knight would likely just retreat, but h5, and now you get h4 ideas, you have to play h3 anyways, and all of a sudden, white is sort of getting destroyed. So look out for those ideas if your opponent ever plays knight d7 before they castle. They might not just be playing for control of these dark squares, but as I said, Crucially, opening up this diagonal can be relevant with ideas of, of g5. So Wesley anticipated this and played the move h3. Now g5 just simply isn't going to be good. The bishop can come back to h2 in one turn. And these ideas are just much less threatening. For example, knight e1, you're not in time to play g4. You now have to go on the defense to defend your uh, h5 pawn with something like this. And it's just a sad story overall. So, h3, Magnus decided just to castle and abandon these g5 ideas for the moment. Um, now, we see white continue with a3. 
which again, some people would say is boring. This is boring chess. Why are we looking at this guy play the move a3, b4? Well, the fact of the matter is, while these moves do look sort of more on the subtle side, they are making huge positional threats. At any moment, if either side just starts wasting time, they could find themselves in a objectively lost position. For example, I think in many amateur games, players with the black pieces might say, hey, hey, my opponent's playing moves like h3 and a3, surely I have time to make left for, for my king as well. And I think after this move, black is, is very seriously close to just busted, just dead lost. For example, if you allow this pawn to get to b4, you allow this knight to get to c5, you start thinking you have to capture this guy, now pawn takes on c5, you're dealing with a protected pass pawn, you're dealing with the queen side opening up with a4, and white is, is very, very much better in this position. So, once again, Magnus Carlsen, a very good chess player, understands that, you know, this is not the simple position that it appears to be on the surface. This is a position that demands urgency. So, he responds to knight a4 uh, with this b4 threat with the move knight to a5. This is the interesting idea Magnus has. What is the point? Well, the point now is if you try to continue with the same idea of b4, uh, it's going to be sort of a mutual knight in uh, each other's side. Like, you know, thorn in the side, but it's a knight. The point is, white gets this knight to c5, but black is also getting their own knight to, uh, to c4. Um, and that's exactly what happens in the game. Uh, under slightly different move orders, we see knight c5 first by Wesley So, knight c4, and now b4 by Wesley So, but this just transposes to what we were looking at. So black to move here has some difficult questions to answer. Uh, the, the most natural seems to be trying to maintain the symmetry even further, for example with the move like b5, but here it's actually going to be white who benefits by capturing on a6 first. If you think you're going to take here, look out this b5 pawn might end up hanging, and also crucially, uh, you might find yourself losing control of the a file. For example, rook a8 here, rook takes a8, queen takes a8, knight d7 is unplayable, and white is going to have very much a distinct edge with control over the only open, well, one of the only open files on the board while the c file remains blocked. Um, and by the way, there are other ways to continue here with white as well, um, but this rook a1 idea I think is enough to be scary of, scared of. So after b4, Magnus Carlsen captures back on c5. And I would like to ask you, chat room, pawn takes or pawn takes, how do you want to capture this knight on c5? One of these moves maintains a slight edge. One of these moves does not. Ah, uh, and the chat room is informing, informing me that Carlson's last loss was in Beale of July of 2018. I think this was played, checking my notes here, in June of 2018. So almost his last loss, but not quite, before the long streak. Of course, he has since lost to Polish phenom Jan Krzysztof Duda. Ah, uh, Pippinchuk likes pawn takes. And... So the correct way to, to capture this pawn is in fact with the D pawn, which to my eyes at first is very counterintuitive. You'd never, you, well, okay, I shouldn't say never because you do want to here, but you usually don't want to capture away from the center. You don't want to give up control of the center. And so B takes C5 would be the more natural approach. As Chess King in the chat says, you also open up the B file for some ideas of attacking this B7 pawn. However, black can almost immediately neutralize all of the threats with the move b6. Now, if white tries to win this pawn, well, it's not going to be your pawn for long. Black is winning it back on the c5 square, and this is what you might expect from a boring exchange love draw. Um, so, b6, really crucial idea here for black to just sort of liquidate everything. Now against d takes c4, this b6 idea isn't going to go over quite as well. For example, bishop c4, 
dc4. Now we can trade queens. And what's the difference with this? Well, now we can take this guy, go knight e5, and this pawn is going to suffer. Dual threats of knight d7 and capturing on c4. So white would be winning a pawn here. So d takes c4, in this case, the correct way to go. Although I would say I do think the chat room's instincts of b takes c5 are, in fact, the, the right way to, to think. It's just that specifically here, you do have to take with the d-pawn to prevent this idea of b6. Now, Magnus was perhaps thinking, well, wait, what's the big idea? I attacked a pawn, and it's not defended. So he took a free pawn. And chat room, what was the big idea? Uh, why did we give up this pawn? What is the point? How are we actually surviving this position with white? For the moment, it looks like we're down a pawn. Our opponent has more center pawns than we do. We perhaps have a strong pawn on c5, but no very clear way to take advantage of this. So what do you think, chat? How do we continue? And notably, if b takes c5 and knight takes a3, white or black would have to deal with a lot of the same counterplay, and perhaps it would even be stronger for, uh, for white there. Which is why b6 was the crucial idea. Chess King asks, did Wesley blunder? I am going to go with no. I think he still had things under control here. Uh, perhaps the best idea is what the chat room is suggesting. The, the simple something like queen a4 or queen b3 probably was, was the way to go. For example, queen b3, if knight back to b5, can actually capture this piece. And again, it's going to be a relevant a file. And also, very importantly, this is sort of an awkward fork for black to deal with. Queen d7, for example, we can snap on a5. And you don't really feel the extra pawn in this position for black, you just feel the extra weaknesses. So white would be doing quite well here. Uh, and perhaps better for black is to just sacrifice the pawn back immediately with something like this. But then you're going to get something similar to what we see in the game, where Wesley wins the pawn back and is just enjoying a pleasant space advantage. Instead, Wesley starts with the move knight d4, which doesn't really spoil anything. But now after bishop e4, if you want to go for these same ideas, uh, I think you do first uh, need to kick away this bishop from the e4 square. So it sort of enticed Wesley into playing the move f3, which, all things being equal, perhaps isn't the greatest move to have included. That's really the only difference between the immediate queen b3 and queen a4, and playing knight d4 first is being enticed to play this move f3. The bishop comes back to g6. Now we do see queen b3. Knight c4, we take, take, and queen takes. And now this is the position uh, on the table. So once again, all from a boring exchange slav, we've now seen a pawn sacrifice by a white, which has since been recouped. We see extra space for white on the queen side, but we do see black with the bishop pair, and we see white with potentially some kingside weaknesses with this move f3 included. So what's actually going on here? Well, it turns out this is in fact just going to be very good for Wesley. The game continued with queen to e8, perhaps not really sensing the danger was Magnus Carlsen. It's actually time for black to sort of beg for trades with something like bishop g5, and after takes takes, the weaknesses on the king side do start to be felt. White has to go for something like f4, a simple queen retreat is uh, called for here. And black's bishop, at least, can play on this open diagonal. Uh, white is probably still a, a bit better here with great squares for the knight, great potential for the knight. But once again, you do feel some weaknesses around the white king. Instead, we see queen e8 by the world champion and the simple bishop retreat, bishop g3 by Wesley. Now after e5, forcing the knight away, the knight just comes back to, to b3. We see bishop d8 now. And perhaps this is the greatest sign that something has gone wrong for black. The pieces just keep moving backwards. There's nowhere to put the black pieces. Queen d5 is Wesley So's move. And after queen b5, 
Uh, Wesley is actually the one going up a pawn here. Don't even think about taking this pawn on b4. You're going to get slammed by the move bishop d6 with c6. Bam. Not so happy here for Magnus. When, of course, b8 queen is difficult to stop. Um, so, queen takes b4. This is perhaps what Magnus missed with this queen b5 idea. But now after bishop b7, simply queen d2. Wesley is up a pawn. This bishop uh, comes into d6, further staying in black's face. Bishop f6 now. If you take this guy, then c takes d6. And this d pawn is simply going to be too strong. Um, in the game, bishop f6, now e4, and you really don't feel the bishop pair here either for black. All of the imbalances do seem to be favoring white in this case. Uh, h6 was played, the knight comes back to d4 now with the absence of the e5 pawn, and this is just a crush like no other. Rook f1 played, king h7, and now once again chat, we've done the hard work, we have a great advantage in our position against Magnus Carlsen. But how do we put the world champion away? How do we put him out of this game? Uh, because there are some problems left for white to solve. Number one, white has great, fantastic controls control over the dark squares, right? We have the dark squared bishop against the light squared bishop. But it is a little bit unclear how we make progress here. Our extra pawn is not a passed pawn, and it's very difficult to make it a passed pawn. So white to move and come up with a winning plan. What can you do? What can you do? And yeah, you guys definitely have the right idea here. You would love to go f4, f5, but you don't want to jump the gun. You don't want to jump the gun at all. After f4, Black has a very nice defensive resource that you guys might have not counted on. So, if you play f4 immediately, now black to move and stay in the game with the fight. f4, I'm willing to call a mistake. White's still better. White's up a pawn. White's always going to be better. But, f4 does make things a bit more difficult. So, of course, the uh, drawing, or not drawing resource, the defensive resource is f5. You know, if you don't stop this move by black, black is going to play it anyways. What's the point of f5? How does it make sense to put even more pawns on the same color as black's bishop? Well, the point is, if we can induce e5, now we're going to reroute this bishop to e6, and black's claim is that he has a nice light square blockade set up. And this is absolutely the worst thing to see if you're playing with opposite colored bishops and you have the extra material. At all costs, you should be looking to stop this type of light square blockade. Which is why Wesley starts with the very accurate move, g4. You want to stop f5 before going f4 yourself. Very important to, uh, to note. So, uh, g4 is a great move by Wesley, now f6 by Magnus. Nothing to fear now from f5, now that we control this square, so f4 by Wesley is the idea. Queen c6 was Magnus's choice, but now f5, bishop f7, and the hits sort of keep coming here. So, you did a great job of advancing your king's side pawns, but once again, how to continue? How do you continue this position? There's something really important in positions with bishops of opposite colors, specifically when there are major pieces left on the board. So that thing that is crucial to positions of bishops of opposite colors with major pieces on the board is, of course, the safety of the kings. So we would love to play the move e5 and break through creating a passed pawn, but this does start to keep things a bit airy around the white king, opening up files like this. And after f takes e, 
bishop takes e, for example, it's still not super clear how we're actually going to break through with uh, white. And in fact, black may even have crazy ideas like g6 here to start breaking down the pawns further and further. And as the kingside pawns disappear, yes, black's king gets weaker, but so does white's king. And that's the sort of double-edged stuff that you really should be looking to avoid. Um, same thing with a question that I just saw. If f4, f5, e takes f, again, you have this move of g4. But even here, perhaps something like queen d3 could be considered. And if you go f5 here, bishop f7, and we're looking at almost an identical position to what we just saw. So g4, definitely the way to start. And here, not the move e5, but we use this pawn to help limit black's activity on e4. That's where it's the most useful. Instead, white is going to push h4 and look to open up the king uh, in this manner. Why is this better than e5 with the same goal? Well, e5 does more to activate black's pieces than it does to activate white's, whereas this idea does more to activate white's pieces 100%. So it's all about looking for ways to favorably uh, open up the position. Um, Magnus tried rook to a8, which is as good a try as any. Very difficult to find moves here for black. Wesley plays the move rook c2, just a subtlety to give this rook access on the second rank. a5 by black, this was Magnus's point with rook a8. But now g5 comes, and bishop h5 activates the bishop again. But now g6, and the king is sort of locked in a jail cell. Um, how is it going to get out? Not so clear. Uh, Wesley now continues with the move b5, with the point being we have gotten huge advantages on the king's side. If the white major pieces get into the 7th rank, or especially the 8th rank, black is just going to be checkmated. So Wesley starts opening up files, giving his pieces access to this queen side. Queen takes b5 was played, rook b2, queen back to c6, rook b6 now, queen c8, uh, queen d5, and this pawn is already becoming indefensible. For example, rook a7. Uh, perhaps the simplest is just rook e to b1, but maybe even better is queen f7 with similar ideas, but also just you know balancing those ideas with checkmating threats as well. It's difficult to even suggest a move here for black, for example, a4, and now the time might be right for a crucial breakthrough. Although, okay, wait a second, wait a second. I don't want to allow this. Don't want to allow this. So maybe this is the crucial breakthrough instead. That is winning the game. Um, but in the game, uh, after queen d5, Magnus perhaps realized this queen f7 move was so powerful and everything was so powerful, and he just plays a4. Wesley just takes this pawn on b7, and rook takes g7 is now a threat. So rook g8 played c6, and Magnus had seen enough and went ahead and resigned this game. So, what happened this game? Why did Magnus just get rolled over? Well, a lot of things happened. Stretching back to this idea of knight d7 by black. This is the type of active idea by black to try to go with g5, but when successfully parried, we once again see that white is just seemingly a few tempi ahead over here on the queen side and is able to turn that into a favorable imbalance. So if you think the exchange slav is the type of boring opening where you can do whatever you want, you are mistaken. It is a very urgent opening in many cases where both sides really need to rush in order to make use of the queen side play. In this case, Wesley's play was just coming a little bit too quickly for Magnus to handle. As far as the move that really gave up the advantage, uh, it's sort of difficult to say, to be honest with you. It's sort of difficult to say. I, I would think here already, uh, white is definitely a bit better. Maybe if the move bishop g5 had been played, black is still in the game. But honestly, it's it's tough to say what exactly went wrong for black. Maybe this knight d7 idea is just a little bit flawed, a little bit too slow. And that, that might just be the case. Um, other than that, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. Wesley just played like a near-perfect game of chess here, and that's what you have to do to be the world champion. 
But yeah, definitely bishop g5 would have been a lot better than queen e8. Bishop g5 keeps black in the game. So if you want to highlight a move that really sort of uh, sent it in the wrong direction, I think queen e8 was that move. Does white have uh, bishop b7 instead of my suggestion of e5? So, okay, at the very end, I was just sort of playing through some moves to highlight the ideas. Um, probably bishop b7 is winning. But maybe there's some craziness here. Bishop takes g6. Got to really be careful of this. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. There's definitely stuff to be careful of, though. So maybe e5 is just the way, the way to do things. By the way, c6 is also good. c6 is also good. White's just sort of crushing it, which is why the game ended in two moves. Mm-mm. <laughs> Nice 10 part series about the Slav, that's where you're wrong. It's about the semi Slav, which I believe is able to avoid this exchange Slav move order. It's just too powerful. It's just too powerful. Um, okay. Um, Jonathan Hart says, I was going to end there, but this question is too funny. He says, I would love to see you analyze some of your own games on your road to 2000. Has that been done? Could we see that? And I've been doing this class for so long that I swear to you, pretty much almost all of my games are have, have been analyzed. I obviously haven't been playing too many more games recently with over-the-board chess being a dead sport. But um, yeah, definitely I can bring back some more over-the-board games, but I really have analyzed many of them already. So go through the VODs if that's what you want to see. If you want to see more of my games, I recommend that. But uh, for now trying to keep things interesting with some some new topics but that is where i'm gonna have to end it today if you guys are still interested in more chess stick around for the end game class last end game class i took you through some basic rook end games um basic meaning sort of uh bare bones rook end games with only one pawn on the board and tonight we're gonna take a look at some really really important rook end games but also some pretty tough ones, but they're important to understand. So I'm going to take you through those in the endgame class right up next. Highly recommend you guys all stick around for it. Other than that, that is where I am going to end tonight's show. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.